Hey there, uh, this is Jeff, and uh, I'm going to be diving into doing a little bit of live coding here in order to get you started on assignment one. Um, so this assignment is mostly about being able to print out uh, a table, um, either to the console or to Excel. I'll show you a little bit of both of those things as we get a little bit further in here. Um, that will show the position, velocity, acceleration, applied force, and the time uh, for a jet ski as we sort of move through this simulation. So as you recall, um, the simulation goes that um, at the beginning, um, 500 newtons is applied to the jet ski up until 5.5 seconds when the engine shuts off, no force is applied. Um, and then at 10 seconds a uh, force of negative 625 newtons is applied until the jet ski comes to a stop so i'm not going to go through all the details of this here but i'm going to go far enough that hopefully you have all the things set up um and then by the time we come around to our class in week two uh we can start really talking about the details so i'm going to dive in and make a new project here. So I'm just going to create a Win32 um, console application. I've already made a folder for this. So this is just going to go in my Jeff's A1 demo folder. Um, it's good if you um, name your your project something that I can easily identify going to go with that so this is going to pop this wizard up uh, I mean if you're unfamiliar um, it's going to ask you a bunch of stuff so you want a console application that's generally the only important thing I'm going to shut these off because I don't need them um, if you leave them in it won't really make any difference it will still work and I hit finish and I'll have a project come together all right um for simplicity's sake, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, organization here uh, because there's a couple files that I just simply don't need. Um, so this stdafx.h and .cpp, both of these files are completely unimportant. Um, they are useful in larger projects, but for now they're just going to kind of get in the way. Um, this target ver.h also totally unnecessary and readme.txt also totally unnecessary. So I'm just going to select all those, right click, remove. Uh, and I'll delete the files from my disk as well. Totally unnecessary. Um, we're not going to have any resource files, so I'm going to get rid of this folder. Um, and so we're left with only one file here. Um, so that is this Jeff Rose assignment one .cpp that I have here and I'm going to rename this file to be called main.cpp. I usually do this because um, that's typically like in C++ that's kind of usually what you end up with as your like main file. Uh, it also includes your main function which is the entry point of your program and I like to call it main.cpp so that I can find it easily later. Uh, that's mostly what this amounts to that's the important bit for me um you'll see now in this file that i have a little red squiggly under include stdafx.h uh, of course this is because i deleted that file um, but i don't need it so i'm just gonna i'm gonna delete this stuff out so i'm right down to a blank slate literally the only thing that my program does is start and exit with a uh with an exit code of zero which tells the operating system nothing went wrong that's it that's all it does um, so uh, usually just a little sanity check that I like to do here is just um, to do some basic stuff just to print hello world out so that I know for sure that everything's cool um, so um, because many of you are new to C++ there's gonna be a couple of includes that I use here that you won't be that familiar with maybe but um, you will get more used to dealing with these as time goes on. So IO stream is a library of functions and objects that relate to 
um, streams of various sorts. This includes streams for like opening and reading and writing files, um, reading from the console, writing to the console. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's that's in there. Um, so I'm going to bring that on and we'll see some usage of that in a moment. Uh, and I'm also going to bring on string. Um, it may come as a surprise to some of you who are used to languages where strings are sort of default objects. In C and C++, they are not. Um, all you have to do is include string here to get access to them, um, but they aren't primitives like a lot of other languages. So um, that's a thing. So for your basic hello world, um, there is a pretty straightforward thing to do. And we're gonna make a little bit of use of both IO stream and string here. So um, in order to print to the console um, using IO stream, I am going to use this, oops, STD. So this is the standard library's namespace, this STD double colon C out. This double colon is what we refer to as the uh, namespace resolution um, operator. So what we're doing here is we're saying, get me the, get me C out that exists within the namespace STD. Um, how do you know to do that? Um, read the documentation. Um, that's kind of the best answer that I can give. C++ is somewhat unforgiving and it really just takes some time to learn some of this stuff. But um, C out has a handy operator that we can use, this double arrow thing, and I can just say hello world. Um, and I don't know, let's give that a try. Or actually, um, here, yeah, let's run this and see what happens. Boom. Okay, so it ran and it closed, and that was very fast, and I didn't even see what happened. Um, so this is the thing that I expected, um, and that's cool. Uh, what's happening here is that because this instruction is running, and then this thing is telling the program to exit, the window pops open for a second, not even long enough for us to read anything, and then it just disappears. So uh, we're probably, most of the time, when we're writing a console application, we're going to want some way to stop it from just closing instantly. And uh, sort of a cheap and dirty way that I do that usually is using the get car function. So this is um, uh, tell the program to wait for a key press. So basically this is like the press any key to continue thing. We're not gonna use the character that it that it takes from the keyboard for anything. We just want it to wait until something gets pressed and then the program will exit immediately. So let's see what that changes here. All right, cool. So we get hello world and I'm just gonna press a space bar. Whoa, it didn't do anything. Okay, so I hit enter. Um, all right, so it's not exactly as I imagined originally, but okay, so cool. So you can just hit enter and close the program. No big deal. Good. So we have something to work with. All right, so now that we've proved that we have a program that works and it doesn't just completely like crash and burn, um, this is probably a good point to start like actually thinking about the problem that we're trying to solve here. Um, so uh, if you recall from the assignment sheet, which I suppose I can open up here. So in this assignment sheet, uh, it's, uh, mentioned that you're going to be building a vector class and a body class. So you have this GD vec2 and GD body. Uh, these are both things that are going to show up in here. Um, so while they're not written this way here, I'm going to suggest actually that we sort of think this through, working our way deeper and deeper through the problem, uh, starting from body and then working our way to vec2. So what we want to do is be able to simulate this jet ski um, moving through the world. We want to know its position, its velocity, its acceleration, um, 
and its mass. Those are those are big things that we need to pay attention to here. But that's not unique to jet skis, right? Like the reason that we're talking about having a body is that in physics, we refer to objects that have mass and that have a position in the world as bodies. So, um, you know, you'll you'll see the planetary bodies, for example, are one one thing that we refer to in that way. Um, so, um, what I'm going to do is, since we know that we have a jet ski and a jet ski is a body, um, we're going to be thinking about the jet ski as a body. Um, so, I'm going to start off working on the body here by just adding a new item. Or actually, I can just add a class, or you can use Shift Alt C, I suppose, if you like. But I'm gonna just right click on the project, go to Add Class. Should give me a wizard here. So, all right, so I'm gonna add a C class, and I want to call it GD Body. I don't have to do anything else special here, uh, and just tell it finish. So, now, if you look over in this Solution Explorer here, you'll notice that there are, in fact, two files uh, called... Um, oh, seriously, I read... Okay, I misnamed it. My bad. Give me one sec. I will just uh, delete those and go add class again. And let's try to spell it correctly the first time. GD body. All right. All right, okay, so back to where we were. So we have two files here. And so what's up with that? Um, I'm sure that this will get brought up in your C++ class, but in C++, classes are a little bit more complicated than, for example, in C Sharp. In C Sharp, you have one class that defines, declares and defines all of the functions that belong to an object. It serves the purpose of not only declaring the interface that um, parts of your program need to adhere to to be able to call functions and use members of your object, uh, but it also does the work of actually defining each and every one of those functions and how they work. Um, in C++, that is generally not how you do things, although you can, um, and for reasons going beyond today's little live coding thing here, uh, it can be a bad idea to roll the two of them into um, one file, even though it is possible. Um, so I'm going to stick with keeping both of these things separate here for now, and um, we'll sort of work with that. Okay, so um, before I move too far into functions, um, we had mentioned the things that a body has, right? We know that a body has a mass. I'm going to call it a double. This could be a float. Um, a lot of the time in game development, we use floats instead of doubles, but um, it's not super important for the sake of this, which we pick. I'm going to go with a double for mass, so we have some floating point value for mass, uh, which we will assume is in kilograms. Um, and then we need some way to keep track of <clears throat> an acceleration. Um, so we've got some acceleration velocity and position. Now both all three of these things are things that are multi-dimensional, right? Like um, if we're talking about something's position x, y, um, we need an object that keeps track of both of those things separately. And that's exactly where this gdvec2 uh, comes into the mix. So um, we're going to define these in a moment once we get a class in place for that. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to add a second class. So I'm going to add gdvec2. <clears throat> All right, so we have a gdvec2. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail at this point about the individual functions that go in here. Uh, our next live coding session, like in class, we'll probably cover more of that. Um, but the important thing that AVEC2 has 
if I could spell that it has a value for x and it has a value for y. That's kind of the important stuff. Um, so these are the these are the big things that we need to be concerned about here. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that for the time being. But that's enough to work with for now. Uh, I'm just going to save this file. I'll explain a little bit more about the CPP files in a moment. For now, I'm mostly going to be working in .h files. Um, we'll talk about .cpp files when we get there. So, um, all right. So, how do I use this gdvec2 inside gdbody? If I just type gdvec2 acceleration, uh, it gives me problems. Oh, well, you know, I should spell it correctly. gdvec2. All right. Well, despite that I now spell it correctly, uh, it still doesn't know what I mean. So what's up? Um, this is a fairly simple one to deal with. We need to um, remember these these things in the weird like triangle brackets. Um, these are things that are, belong to the standard library. But this include statement that I have here is something that I'm going to use again. So in here, I want an include, and I'm going to use double quotes here. And uh, you'll see that Visual Studio is kind enough, uh, seeing as I got the syntax right, to let me know what files I could potentially include. And unsurprisingly, it shows me the body that I have put in here and vec2 that I've put in here. You'll note that only the .h files show up. Um, this is usually the convention that we follow where we include things by their .h file because the .h file describes the interface to that object. And as time goes on, we'll maybe talk a little bit more about what that means, um, and I'm sure it'll come up in your C++ class. But for now, um, we have included gdvec2.h, and look at that. So no more red squiggly mess. So I'm just going to... Um, expand this out so I'm going to have a velocity and I'm going to have a position and all of those things are vector twos. Great. So we have the basics. We have at least the data that we need to hold on to here even if we don't have much of what these objects require in terms of functions. But that's a good start. So I'm just going to save all my files. Okay, everything's saved. Um and I'm going to jump back to the main here just to um, kind of take stock of where we're at and think a little bit about um, what we want to do in the end because ultimately we want to be able to print out um, table rows that look a little bit like this, right? We want the time, force, acceleration, velocity, position running across um, and we would like to be able to see that on the console um, and preferably also dump it to a file because when it's in a file it's actually really easy to bring it into Excel so that you can make these charts um, prove to yourself that everything's working the way that it should. So, um, certainly doesn't hurt um, to think a little bit about starting from the basics um, where let's just um, see if we can make a vector and print a vector. Um, so uh, it shouldn't surprise anybody that if I want to use gdvec2 in my main file, then I'm going to have to include it, just like I did in my body. So cool, I got gdvec2.h in here. And then that gives me the ability to say, Um, let's make a gdvec2 and we'll call it force, let's say. I'm going to have that gdvec2.force and, um, well, for the sake of it, let's set its x to 500 and its y to 0, just like we had at the start of the uh, the problem there. Whether it stays written like this or not, um, that will be up to you and your own sort of personal choices of style, but um, 
let's go with this and just try and print this out and see what it looks like. Unfortunately, printing it, um, we're going to have to sort of format the printing of its x and y values kind of separately so that everything comes out the way that we want, but um, it's doable. So I'm just going to piece together a couple of bits here. So the nice thing about C out is that you can actually use it to string together a whole bunch of different values uh, and just use those um, like double triangle brackets to concatenate everything together and um, give you uh, an end result here. So um, yeah, sure, let's just do this for now. So we'll print the force X and the force Y. I think I'm going to leave out the y values for um, sort of my my last idea of this because um, y values aren't really needed for anything anywhere. Um, oh, and I should note that there is um, standard end line is what this means. So this is um, for those of you who are familiar, the um, backslash n is a new line character. Uh, so you could say backslash n here and it would basically mean the same thing but um, this constant is kind of useful so that you don't have to remember and also it works on both windows and linux and mac machines uh, without doing any weirdness um, some of you may be familiar with the fact that um, new line characters on windows and linux boxes are a little bit different so um, all right let's give this a shot we got our little program cool so we got this thing printing out in brackets 500 comma zero so that's all this c outline consists of so this is my first bracket x value separated by a comma y value close close with another uh in parenthesis so all right we have the basic idea of printing out a force now but we want to be able to print out a lot more than that, right? Like we want to be able to print out table lines that um, are quite a bit more here than what this is. So let's um, then go to the next step of complexity, because many of the things in here that we oops, many of the things in here that we want to print out are things that belong to a body, right? So let's get a let's get a body involved here so I'm going to include that and so I'm also going to make an object let's call it jet ski so we've got GD body jet ski and I'm going to start off just setting its values um, eventually once we get to building functions for these things um, these will have constructors where we can sort of initialize these values immediately but for now I think that it's good just to be able to sort of work with this and like directly kind of play with the values that we have here so in a mass of 200 um, and um, so we've got Oh geez, yeah, I guess this is going to turn into quite a few things here. So let's just set a bunch of stuff to zero. Or, hmm. Maybe this is a good time to do this jet ski constructor. In fact, let's just go and do that right now so that we don't get too, uh, too out of joint. All right, so I just deleted this squiggle gd body so for those of you unfamiliar this is a destructor this is what gets called when the object is going to be deleted from memory um you'll probably talk about this more in your c plus plus class but um you will eventually need to know your way around how to use these so that you don't end up leaking memory um for now we won't really deal with that let's just keep it simple and um focus on taking in what we what we need to take in here so I'm just gonna make a constructor that takes in a mass for now um, okay so whoa what's the deal with all of this like it's giving me like all this trouble um, 
it's okay. It's fairly simple. This is where that CPP file comes in. So it's claiming when I hover over GD body function definition for GD body not found. Well, what does it mean? Definition for GD body. The CPP file is responsible for the definitions of your functions. So the .h, this is a function declaration or a function signature. I will use that word um, function signature probably pretty often. This tells you how you call this function. Um, and the CPP file needs to reflect it in order to describe what the function actually does. So I'm just going to update this to contain the same variables here. Okay, so the CPP file is no longer complaining. Everything's cool. And over on this side, great, no complaints anymore. So important thing to remember is that you need the function declaration or the function signature to match the definition on the CPP side. You'll also notice this GD body um, scope resolution operator in front here. If it's missing this, you will have problems. I guarantee you that you will run into that problem and you will wonder what's going on. All right, but let's just um, get into the meat of this. So what do we want a constructor to do? Usually just to initialize values. Um, in C++, values do not initialize themselves. If you create a new object, you cannot count on any of your object members being set to zero unless you do it yourself. So um, word of warning, do it yourself. <laughs> um, so uh, let's do that. Um, so we want to set the mass is equal to new mass. And um, so we have an acceleration. Um, that we're going to want to um, we're going to want to initialize that, but um, oh, in fact, that means that we need to not take one more step back here. Uh, we probably want to look at the constructor for our vector, and I'm just going to do something very simple for that right now. Uh, so I don't need a destructor for this either. So I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, this GD vec two. Uh, constructor here I'm gonna leave it with no parameters and I'm just simply gonna say in it x equals 0 y equals 0 so all that's meaning is that when we create a new vector object it will automatically set x and y to 0 so that we can count on them being set to 0 um, just by virtue of these things existing um, they will automatically get set to 0 and mass being sort of the odd one out uh, we'll get set to new mass using this constructor. So, okay, at this point, we should be able to just say GD body jet ski, and this is a little bit unlike C sharp, so bear with me here. I'm going to put a bracket here, and I'm going to say 200. What is going on there? So, unlike C sharp, I am not using new to create a new object here. I am in fact creating a new object in place. Uh, when you talk a little bit more about memory management, this will become clear. Um, but basically what this is doing is it's creating a new GD body called jet ski and using the constructor and passing 200 as its mass here. So that's what's happening on this line. So I'm creating a body called jet ski with a mass of 200 kilograms. So um, let's go a little bit further and see about uh, what we want to do to print out a complete, uh, a complete line um, for our table. I'm going to add one more thing that I probably want to keep track of, and that's that I'm going to want our current time. Our simulation is going to tick through time. so. Uh, we we're going to want some value for time uh, and we're going to want to be able to print that out. So we've got the time, we've got the force, and we got the body uh, that we're interested in following here. So these are the three parts that we're sort of most interested in seeing here. So um, if we want this table to look anything like 
what we have here, uh, we probably want to um, actually print out the header. So that's boring and it's easy. I'm just going to try and copy and paste this. This may not work at all, but that's going pretty well, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to start off um, separating these things with commas. Um, so there are tabs between them right now, and that may work out to be what we want in the end, but um, let's just take a look. Uh, so all squared. Let's reformat this slightly to scrunch these things down a tiny bit. Right, position in meters. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say standard C out. Where did my time go? Uh, sure. Fine. I'll do that. All right. Dump all those things out and then standard and line because we want to bump this down to the next line after this, right? Okay. So this is our table header and that we've got that printed out. So let's try printing one line of the values underneath. So we've got time first, then force, then acceleration, velocity position. So, oh, I forgot a couple spaces here. Let's put those in there. That looks a little better. All right, sure. So, let's um let's break this down just a tiny bit. I'm some of you will look at this formatting and you're going to go, "Jeff, you're crazy. What are you doing?" Um I promise you it looks pretty. We're, we'll just bear with me for a moment. We're, we're going to go on a trip. Um, all right, so I'm going to say print out the current time, and after the current time, give me a comma. Next line down. Then give me force dot x, and give me a comma. Then now. I want to be clear here that when I'm doing this, I don't mean that in my output, like go to the next line. I'm just doing this so that it's easy for me to read it. This is only a technique that I'm using in order to make my code e easy to understand. It doesn't really reflect what's going to come out of the program. Um, so as you'll see in a moment, uh, we'll get there. Okay, so now we've got uh, the jet ski, we want, oops, not the cat ski, the jet ski dot acceleration dot x. Now I'm only going to print out the x values for each of these things here because the, the y values stay at zero the whole time. Uh, there's really no point in printing those out for the sake of this chart. So I'm just going to keep things simple. Um, so there we go. So we've got the current time, a comma, force x, comma, jet ski acceleration x, comma, jet ski velocity x, comma, jet ski position x, and we don't need a comma after this. We just need the end of the line. That's all we need. So let's see what this prints out. What we should expect here is that we'll get a current time of zero. The force should print out as 500, but the position, velocity, or the acceleration, velocity, and position of our jet ski should all be zero. So let's see what this does for us. Hey, not bad. All right, so um, looking at this, you're going to go like, well, how do I even remember like what line goes with what thing? And um, I totally understand what where you're coming from. This is not a very well formatted table. Uh, this is because we haven't done anything to try and line these things up. All we did was put commas between them. And obviously, if it's not, if my first line here is zero, it's not as long in characters as time, space, bracket, seconds. Um, and that's not going to line up. So um, if you want to make this a little bit prettier to be able to look at, uh, there's a little bit more work that we can do here to, to make this turn out cleanly. Um, probably the simplest thing that I can sort of recommend is that um, you jam tabs into the middle here. And so, okay, I want to be totally clear here. So what, I, what I've done here is 
there is a comma and a space between time and force here. I can insert a tab character with backslash t. So I'm putting backslash t in here. Backslash t, backslash t. I'm just replacing each of these sort of comma spaces. And I'm going to do the same thing down here. This isn't going to work out quite right, but it's going to be pretty close and it'll be easy to fix. So let's try. So having gone through and replaced all of our comma separations with tabs, let's, let's see what that works out like. Okay, it's closer. It's not all the way there, but obviously this line is not lined up yet. So um, I'm just going to add actually a second tab there. You will find actually that all that's gone on here is that these each of these statements is just two tabs wide that's all that that's all that's breaking here so by inserting two tabs here we should get enough space to pad everything out so let's see what this turns into pretty sweet all right cool so now as these print downward as long as none of none of these values come out being eight characters or longer everything's going to work out nicely here um, if you are printing a table where that sort of thing happens, you maybe have a little bit more work on your hands. But for the sake of printing out values like this here, um, this will this will do for for what we're doing today. So that's like kind of the minimum that we can do in terms of printing something out to the console. But what if we want to print something out to a file? Um, it shouldn't surprise you that that's actually not that different. There's a little bit more work involved, but it's really pretty simple stuff. Um, so here, I'm going to do this very same thing, but instead I'm going to dump these things out to a file. Um, so here, what we want is... I'm going to reach into my standard library and I'm going to grab a new type of thing that you will not have seen before. This OF stream, which stands for output file stream. So that's what I'm going to call variable just so that it's not confused at all. Um, why are we complaining? That's true. I do need to include something new at the top here. I need to put oops, OF stream in up here. So I have access to that. Oh, my mistake. F stream. F stream includes both OF stream and IF stream, which uh, should surprise no one, is to be input file stream. So, um, okay, so I have my output file stream. So that is the statement that tells it to exist. Um, I'm going to use it and I am going to call it open method. And I am going to tell it that I want to dump these things out to a file that I call table.csv. You can call it whatever. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what CSVs mean and how they will be helpful to you, especially in this course in a moment. Um, but we'll get there. Um, and when you open a file, uh, it's usually a pretty good idea to just write in the statement that closes the file immediately. So I'm just going to space this out a little bit, and I'm going to say dot close. If for any reason I forget to close the file, um, the file that was being opened here will be locked in your OS uh, until you reboot. So, or at least run the program again. So um, be cautious of that. Um, this kind of thing can often prevent you from deleting files and folders or moving files. You definitely encountered this before on your computer, and now you know why it happens. Uh, most of the time that sort of thing is because a program exited uh, before closing a file. So make sure to close your file up. So, okay, so we've got this file opened and we've got a statement to close it, but what do we do to actually put things out into the file? Well, you know how this standard cout has this arrow syntax where we're just taking these strings and dumping them out to standard out? Well, uh, it should please you to know 
that I can in fact do exactly the same thing here, except instead of calling standard C out, I can just use my output file stream. And um, I can grab this block here for writing this second line out. I'm just going to bring these things together a little bit. And I'll copy that in here and I'll just change standard C out to be output file stream. So, uh, so now we've got this block, which is the table header and one line to the console. And this one to an output file. And let's just put in another comment here open an output file and we'll just say close the output file. Might as well comment our stuff so that we know basically what's going on in here. So if I run this, you're going to say, well, what changed? Everything looks the same. Um, and you would be right. Um, yeah, nothing really changed here. Uh, if we want to actually see what happened here, uh, we need to go look at the folder that we're working in here. So um, I just have this on my desktop uh, under Jeff's A1 demo. So you want to go look in the project folder um, that you've set up in C++. So for me, that's here, this um, Jeff's A1 demo, Jeff Rose Assignment 1, Jeff Rose Assignment 1. And sure enough, I can find table.csv. So this is the same folder that all of my source files are in. So my, my main.cpp, my gdvec2, my gdbody, all those things are in there. My table appears there with them. So I'm going to open this file up, and you're probably going to look at it and go, that's a mess. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit of why. So let's see, once this thing opens up. Come on, Excel, it's a 1K file can't be too much of a chore. <clears throat> Seriously? Come on, let's do this. All right, well, um, while I'm waiting, I will talk about this a little bit. So note that this file that I created is called table.csv. So .csv is a very old file format and it stands for comma separated value. So what I printed out here, while it has all those nice tabs in it, is kind of a jumbled mess in here. So while those tabs that we put in are really great for being able to see what happens on the console, and let's run that. So those tabs are really nice for spacing things out to present things on the console, but they really don't do much for us if we actually want to print these things to a file in a useful way. If I had put those comma separated, uh, if I had put commas between each of these values, you would get zero here, then 500, then zero, then zero, then zero, and all of these things would be spaced out nicely, separated individually into their cells. And then if you wanted to go about graphing these things, it would be a breeze because everything's already broken up nicely for you. So um, let's do that. So now this is probably a pretty good time to start thinking about organizing your code a little bit. Yes, you can. Uh, you may find that you want to make a function to do some of these things. I'm just going to kind of do them in place. Um, but Ideally, I would suggest making a function that will output a line for you, like one line to the file, um, where you can tell it what you want to jam in here as the separator. Um, but anyway, for the time being, let's just put these commas in here, um, and we'll see what that changes. So this is basically taking us right back to how we had this originally. Uh, so it certainly goes to show that like one way of formatting for a file is great, but presenting it visually is pretty crap. So um, you're going to find that sometimes those two different circumstances don't really work out to be exactly the same. 
um, and this is one of those cases. So I'm going to just run this program again after adding all those commas in. So we get the same thing that we always did here because we still have tabs printing out to the console. But now when I open table.csv, lo and behold, everything is organized nicely. And uh, if I want to, I can just use uh, Excel, tell it to widen all those columns so that all the headers fit. And awesome, uh, we're looking good. So um, that's a pretty good place to be in, in terms of uh, being able to sort of dump data out. But um, right now we don't have anything that works, like it doesn't do very much yet. And that's gonna be where our next sort of in-class live coding session comes in. Um, this has been like a good primer on getting objects and sort of understanding like how to get at their data and how to use them for things. Um, but we're gonna move into how we build functions for these things um, and particularly the complicated subject of how to overload operators which is um, dangerous not dangerous can be very confusing if you abuse it um, so we're going to discuss that briefly next time around and we're going to talk a little bit about how you might go about implementing some of the functions that make up the body and your vector two so for now, uh, that's probably a good point to stop off at. I'll see you in class next Wednesday. See you later, everybody.